Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode two of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Tim Thompson, and Tim has been working in the ELT industry in Korea for 20 years. He has taught at three universities and works with publishers, government ministries and research centers, major corporations and educational training centers to provide academic and professional skills training, teacher training, interview and language assessment services, proofreading and startup coaching. A popular conference teacher, Tim has been hosted by schools and organizations around the world for invited talks and longer training sessions. His website is Tim. Thompson, ELT.com, and he also runs a freelancing business called Archer Consulting. I had a great chat with Tim. Hope you enjoy it. Hey, everyone. Buckle up for a new episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast, the one and only podcast made to help you launch your business or take your existing business to a level of success you could never have imagined. Whether you're a school owner, freelancer, publisher, or other entrepreneur, you're sure to pick up lots of actionable advice when you listen to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Remember to visit eflmagazine.com for great articles and features. Without further ado, here's your host, the founder of EFL Magazine, Philip Pound. So welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. We're really flying through them. Um, uh, another great guest today, and we have Tim Thompson. And Tim is a freelancer and educational consultant, and his website is Tim Thompson ELT. That's T H O M P S O N E L T dot com. And uh, hello, Tim. Hi, good. Happy to be with you. And uh, tell me a little bit, you're in Korea at the moment? Yes, 20 years in now. I've oh. been here off and on for a long time. So uh, about, about 20, 20 plus years, and I'm in Daejeon. I've been in Daejeon since 2002. Tell me about Daejeon for people who are not too familiar with Korea, or, or for those who are, um, what kind of place is it? Uh, central. It's mm-hmm. in the middle of Korea. Um, it's not fancy or has anything super super famous but uh you know if you know someone here it's a nice place to visit very comfortable and a good place to stop if you're heading down south uh from seoul which everyone seems to stay in seoul but if you're coming down south daejeon is a great place to stop Uh, give me a shout and i can give you some recommendations if you're coming in okay and how how is life in Korea at the moment with the, the COVID situation? I'm trying not to ask so much because unless it's kind of specific to a country. So I haven't uh, spoken to anyone in Korea yet. So I, and, I, and I realize this may if somebody listens to this podcast in a year or two years, it may be interesting history. But uh, yeah, <laughs> how how are things there at the moment? Up and down, you know, mm. it's, it's, uh, we have a couple good weeks or a couple bad weeks or a good month or two and then a not good month or two. So I think right now we're hopefully coming out of kind of a, a down bad period and hopefully things will open up a bit more. Mm. But you know, since it's the end of January, uh, we've got to worry about school starting again. I think it starts mm. a little bit different than it does in Japan. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at the start of a new school year coming up and the big decision will be for universities as well as public schools, do you continue online or do you go back face to face and risk that? But mm. you know, online also has its own demerits, I guess you could say. So yeah. mm. it's going to be tricky for the policy yeah. I do not envy them. Mm. Mm. And as regards day to day, are restaurants open? Yeah. Uh, yeah. These days you can go and sit in a coffee shop, um, you know, certainly mask off to eat no one bats an eye but mm. uh, in with the city where i live i would say 90 percent of the people walking down the street or even going for a hike you're going to see them wearing a mask yeah mm. which i guess is good yeah it it is uh so it's it, it's more or less the same as tokyo really we've kind of cut back on hours so i think most things finish at 8 p.m now or should do um and yeah, the school's the same there. It's really up in the air as to you know, what's going to happen is going to be online or at home or some kind of hybrid model. I think the students are enjoying it because uh, they are supposed to be watching some videos, but uh, I don't think they're watching them of uh, 
you know, the I think it does help video. with the stress levels, but mm. you know, it sort of creates a different kind of stress because you don't have the contact with your friends that you're used to. My daughter's uh, mm. in middle school now, and so she enjoys the enjoyable parts and complains about the the less fun parts. Uh, so yeah, I but you know everybody is connected online. If if this had happened, what twenty five thirty years ago? <laughs> no, I can't imagine. Yeah, wow. That would be, uh, yeah, we're just living in uh, in a time of hyper connectivity. And uh, yeah, uh, so let me move on a little bit uh, to how you got to Korea. Where, what's your background, Tim? Where are you from originally? From Lexington, Kentucky in the States. <clears throat> Sorry, I um, did a couple of study abroad years in high school and in university and really enjoyed that. So when I saw an advertisement saying, would you like to go teach in South Korea? I thought this could be a similar way to do a year in another country while getting paid. And it kind of stuck. Mm. Mm. And that was 20 years ago. Yes, I mm. first came and lived in the southern part of South Korea and down in Chinju, 96 to 98. Oh, OK. Then, yeah, it was a while back. Then I went home for a while and missed it. So I came back in 2002. Mm. I, I, I'm not sure if... Uh... If you're familiar with Michael Palin's documentaries in in the 1980s, early 90s, where he he traveled around the world, and and one I was watching last week actually on Korea, and this was early probably early 90s. Um, I think you know things would have moved on in 98, but you know we, we didn't have the uh, connectivity and we didn't have K-pop and all the Korean soft power around the world. So so Korea back then seemed seemed exotic to me. In 1990. Yeah. How did you feel coming to Korea? Was was it very different? Was it a culture shock for you? Well, the the southern Mm. part's traditionally a bit more conservative, and Chinju is not a not a small city, but not a big city either. Mm. So again, it was fairly conservative. There was still sort of a ban on Japanese cultural imports at that Uh, time. So yes, yeah, yeah. Mm. Getting a sneaky ex Japan CD was a very ooh big deal at the time. Mm. Um, everyone had pagers when I first arrived, uh. <laughs> and then I remember transitioning into cell phones. That was a fun time. Mm. Wow, but yeah, you pagers. Have to go to a public uh. phone and answer someone's call that you got on your pager. So those mm. were, that was the old days. Mm. Pager beeper, are they the same thing? Yeah, beep. Yeah, yeah. I think it was called is is how we uh, Koreanized it. We called it a beepy. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So you started, and uh, where did you start? Did you start in in university? No, in, I started. Uh, I paid my dues. Come on mm-hmm. now. I, okay, I, I, I suffered through a, a year in a language school with split shifts, oh. six forty or seven forty a.m. starts and nine or oh. ten p.m. finishes. Uh, all levels, adults, middle school, high school, children, everything. I ah. had every book. I had every level. Um, often in the same day. Mm. It was really trial by fire. I had maybe one day of training. Mm. I to follow this other teacher around and watch what they do and like, good luck. Mm. Yeah, I, le- I learned a ton, obviously. It was a very productive year. And then I went to the university in that city for the second year in Chinju. And then <clears throat> things didn't quite work out the way I wanted. So I went back home for a while and then came back and worked at two different unis mm. uh, until I started this company. Okay, so that's a nice segue. We'll we'll move on to your starting the starting your company. So you you made a break away from English language teaching. Why? Well, I I like teaching. I liked mm-hmm. and still like the idea of teaching. But you know, when you work at a university or you work inside a department, there are certain rules. There are certain management people and management styles that, you know, they, they usually transition every couple of years. And so you really don't know what you're going to get. Mm. But it, midway through the the second university job here in, in Dejan, I sort of found myself enjoying the side projects that I was doing more than the actual job itself. Mm-hmm. And I worked for like maybe one of the, the bigger name schools in Korea, which helped a lot as far as opportunities to do other things. But, Mm -hmm. you know, you get a call to say, can you come in and, you know, sit in on these interviews and we'll pay you for that? Or can you come in and speak to this group of teachers and we'll pay you for that? Or, you know, come in and can you can you check this editing thing? Or can you help this person prepare for a big interview? And so like that was real, I I enjoyed doing that quite a bit. But then Mm. the school 
felt like they needed to crack down and say, no, no, that's not why you're here. You need to focus on this, that, or the other. And mm. so eventually, you know, I started planning, I don't want to say my escape, but planning my transition into this. So anyone who's, who's listening and thinking about transitioning on after university teaching, I would say start your, your planning quite early. Mm. I think I started maybe two years before I actually left the uh, beautiful, beautiful salaried mm. position. Yeah, so I, I can understand somebody working in a language school, the, the money's not so hot and you, you want to get out, the hours are long and uh, maybe unthankful sometimes. Uh, but, you know, university teaching in Japan, maybe in Korea as well, it's it's quite okay. You know, you've got a... a, a in in some cases it's it's a pension position you've got paid holidays yeah. and uh, um it's difficult I do miss to leave paid holidays yeah mm, yeah <laughs> it, it is it difficult to leave what was it a was it a difficult decision for you or i i put it this way 5 hmm. years in no regrets okay gotcha looking back no regrets but at the right. time i'm sure it was well, just just like your income as a freelancer, your feelings also roller coaster up and down and you go through a myriad of emotions depending on how things are going at that moment. Obviously, mm. uh, the last year of COVID uh, prevented me from doing a lot of the kind of things that I would normally do. Mm -hmm. And I do tend to travel quite a bit and go give talks and meet different people in, in other countries. And that was put to the side. Mm. So. Yeah, this last year was challenging, but I guess the positive way to look at it is that I came out and still did okay financially, and and you okay. turned, you know, met some new clients and things happened. That were mm. Okay, so you've left university, you've made the break. It's it's not such a difficult decision for you, and uh, you decide to. How do you make a decision? It, was it the side projects that you were doing in university? You found that they were the most enjoyable, and you said, "Yeah, let's do my own thing and focus on that." That's that was the goal, obviously, was mm. to try to then build or increase on the number of side projects or the frequency of side projects or tell some of the people I was working on those projects with, hey, I can do more or we can turn this into something steady or, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm available. So that that was a big thing. So obviously, uh, while we're talking, I'm going to use the word networking quite a few times. Because OK, mm. critical. It is critical to. Um, success if you're going to start your own business or, or freelancing company. Yeah. Mm. And so you started your freelance company and your, can we have a quick plug for your company? What's your company called? Uh, it's called uh, Archer Consulting. Um, mm -hmm. I chose that because I liked the, the uh, idea of precision that archery entails and uh, actually Korean Olympic team, one of their strongest ah. events is archery. So I mm. thought that would be a good match for the local cultural side of it here as well isn't there some guy he's uh, legally blind but he's an archer he's korean guy isn't he i don't know about that that's yeah. like maybe you know one of the other i don't know what you call it in these days paralympics or something like that but yeah. their men's and women's teams are very strong and usually mm -hmm. quite well in the summer mm -hmm. olympics mm -hmm. so you got into freelancing uh so we're going to talk a little bit about what you do what uh so presenting academic writing is that right that's lots of stuff so yeah mm. here, let me tell you the good side of what i do and the bad side of what i do mm -hmm. the good side is there's tons of variety you can't get bored because i get to do a lot of different things okay um in a typical day you know obviously there's some editing jobs will come in so it could be something from a huge 30 page academic paper to a short email i have different clients that will send i have different requests Okay. Um, in normal times, I do a lot more face-to-face -face teacher training or special lectures, but uh, those, I wouldn't say have dried up totally, but it's very hard. I had one canceled that was supposed to be going on right now, actually. There was mm. a three thing that got canceled kind of at the last minute because they were scared of, of COVID stuff. Mm. I get called in to be an interviewer for different, you know, English interviews and level test type things. Okay. Th things that, you know, I had was, was an IELTS examiner. And so that made me qualif more qualified to do those sort of things. I'll get called down to um, a government research center or a, or a private company to go in and do writing training or presenta uh, presentation skills training for them. Uh, you know, if you're looking for more avenues for income, you can write a book, 
Um, you can be a MC or conference presider. And then I've had some really weird, fun things come in, like a university in Vietnam was trying to start a new program and they wanted people to come in and give some ideas. Or uh, mm. when we had the Winter Olympics here, I had a company that was making some new sort of recycling thing and they wanted someone who could help explain it to different people. So I think what they call us a scientific communicator or something like that. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I got to go to Kazakhstan a couple of years ago and sort of consult on different English related things for them. I was there for a month, really cool opportunities come up. So I would say this also, like if you're, if your listeners are thinking about trying to do these kinds of things, the, the two main things are one, you need to sort of have a way to show that you're qualified slash experienced. Mm -hmm. And then the other key thing is to be available. Cause you know, like, you know, when you work for a university and someone says, can you come here for a week? Their answer is going to be like, well, no, I've got to teach my classes. I can't just run off for a week mm. where that's my advantage. So I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm not doing anything. No mm. problem. Mm. So when you first started your freelancing business, uh, you you had some clients already while you were teaching and you just quit the teaching job or how? how well, yeah, happen? like I said, I mean, mm. I was planning this for a couple of years. So mm. certainly in the last year when I pretty much made a decision, this was going to be my last one year contract or last, you know, finish up this two year contract. I can't remember which one it was. Mm -hmm. I started reaching out to people and saying, hey, you know, I'm going to be available. We should talk about some things. Mm. And yeah, one or, you know, a couple of them actually said, okay, let's start something up. Or some people I was working with said, let's continue this. And then, you know, obviously you use social media and you let people know what you're doing. And then, you know, I actually had some friends do me some favors and recommend me for a couple of positions and Fantastic. opportunities. So really, mm. yeah. Then again, networking, we're back to networking again. Yeah. Yeah. So you you had you had some business coming in, you're trying. And you weren't shy about getting yourself out there and there and uh, asking the questions. And No, you can't. Yeah. Be. You can't. Yeah. You can't assume that people will just, you know, speak for you. You need to go out there and speak for yourself. Mm -hmm. So that, that's for for some of our listeners that may be looking to transition from uh, university teaching or, or or just be involved in this world in, in some way as as an entrepreneur in the ELT world. Um T give me some tips on networking. First of all, let's say online or in person, or uh, if you go to wh whatever a trade fair conference, uh, what's the Tim Thompson lowdown on networking? Let's, let's start with the online stuff because, you know, everyone thinks that they need to maybe advertise. And I am not a big fan of that. And I'll tell you why, especially for something like editing, editing, there's a lot of competition out there, you know, there's mm. places all over the world that might do it quite a bit cheaper, or, you know, certainly there are places that are probably even more qualified than than what I am. But mm. when you advertise, what happens is you get a lot of requests for quotes, which means everyone's looking for the cheapest price. Mm. Whereas mm -hmm. if people hear about you word of mouth, then generally they're they're looking for more quality over cost savings. And especially mm. when, when your clients now are, are government research centers that already have a budget, uh, universities that already have a, a pretty good budget, you know, that's not going to be the issue for them. For them, they're going to want quality. Mm. So when someone says, look, I have worked with this guy. I know this guy. I know what he can do. You should call him. The, the whole mentality of this transaction is different than if you said, Hey, person, I don't know what's your price. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's a little bit high because mm. they don't know what you do. They don't know about your service and you don't mm. have a personal recommendation. Mm. So that's for the online stuff. Mm. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a story because stories are fun in podcasts. I'll tell you a story. A couple, I guess, maybe the year after um, I started going out on my own, you know, you don't have a lot of clients at first. So you, you tend to spend a lot of time thinking, oh my God, did I do the right thing? Mm. And I was playing around on Google flights one day and I saw this pretty cheap flight to Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was super cheap and I was like, okay, boom. And I bought it. <clears throat> so I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Istanbul. I don't know anyone in Istanbul. And I reached out on Facebook and I said, does anyone know someone in ELT in Istanbul? And a friend who was living in Japan at the time said, actually, yeah, you should contact this person. Mm -hmm. 
So I was like, all right. So I contacted this person, sent them an email and said, this person uh, suggested I contact you. I'm going to be in town. Would you like me to come and talk to your students? I do this sometimes. And she was like, absolutely. That'd be great. Went to talk to the students. I think it was about presenting or something. And then she told a friend, hey, this guy's in town. You should get him. So I went to her university as well. Six months later, they're having a, a big conference and they invite me to come back. And I went three or four years in a row. Wow. So again, it comes to qualified, available, networking, all these words come back. Mm -hmm. But you just need an opportunity to prove yourself. And the way to get your foot in the door somewhere is one, we'll do it for free. And then two, have someone who knows them personally recommend you. Mm. And then you never know what's going to happen. All sorts of fun things can happen after that. Mm. And ask. Sure. I mean, again, what's the worst thing they can say, right? No, mm. thank you. Okay, no, no big deal. And I think that's, I don't know if it's particularly a problem in, in this industry. Um, I've, you know, my background is not just in this industry, but I do get quite a few emails from people and I, I'm, probably mentioned this uh, on another podcast and they send me materials they send me pdfs but they never actually tell me what they want you know this situation people will send you something they send you a link and uh to be honest i because i get them i i, I don't reply because if, if the person said will you do this would you be up for that i'd probably answer but uh i would say 95 percent don't and probably they also don't do a really good job of selling what the benefit is. Mm. Like, you know, do you have this problem? This can help people or the people you're, you're connected to or your audience mm. with this problem. What do you think? Mm. That's one thing. But, I, you know, I, I wonder if I think in our industry, there's a bit of imposter syndrome as well, mm. because it can be a little bit easy, at least in the olden days, for sure. You could walk in here with just a basic college degree in almost anything and get a job. Mm. So I think maybe imposter syndrome is is one of the reasons for that, that people think, oh, this probably isn't that very good. And mm. they don't believe in the quality of what they're offering. Mm. Hmm. that's uh, it out there. it's the third podcast we've talked about <laughs> imposter syndrome I've, I've spoken uh last week rachel roberts who's a um a therapist and and uh, coach in in the uk and also uh, today i was talking to miranda crowhurst and they all mentioned imposter syndrome so yeah no it, surprise yeah and that's one thing they had to overcome is uh did you experience that yourself Sure. Uh, mm. Certainly when I, when I transition more into editing, mm. because, you know, while I think I do a pretty good job, I know there are people that have a lot more training or, or much better qualifications or more experience. You know, they may have 20 years of experience under their belt. Yeah. It's hard to, to think, Oh gosh, well, you know, what if they ever contacted those people? I'm, I'm sure they'd be much better than I am. Mm. Mm. But you know, all you can do is do your best and try to, to, communicate well with your clients and uh, you know, do things and with an reasonable amount of time and be honest with your billing and, you know, all the, all the things like that, you can just do your best. Mm. And you, you just mentioned your clients. So that's a, a nice little segue. Um, keeping clients happy. Yeah. Well, it's, they're all different, right? It's like, mm. it's like having a house full of pets. You love them all, but they're all <laughs> going to have different needs and different uh, ways of, of working with you and, and interacting with you. So yeah, I have clients that are not afraid to send me a message at 1030 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm. um, I have clients that think, yeah, well, why, why shouldn't I send him this on the, on the weekend? Surely he can, he can sneak that in and get it done. Then I have clients that are very, very, like almost apologetic for sending something in the middle of the day. Oh, I'm sorry about sending this, but you know, can you do this within two weeks? And you're like, yeah, it's going to take five minutes, no problem. So mm. clients are all are all different because mm. people are all different. So the way that maybe that they've interacted with people before, or they get treated by their mm. coworkers or bosses, maybe influences that. It's really hard to say, but their mm. variety is the word of of how clients uh, appear to me, and. Yeah, I, some that I work with almost on a daily basis, and then there's some I don't hear from for six months, and then they they pop in like, "Hey, how's how, how have you been? Can you do this?" 
So mm. it's, it's fun. It's interesting. Mm. And managing client expectations is really important. I, I learned this lesson when I worked for online recruitment company. And, you know, uh, just like you with, you know, client expectations, personalities, all different. It, we, you could run one ad for one company. You could hire 15 people perfectly matched for a role. You ask the client, how did you feel about the service? Eh, it was okay. You could advertise another role. They would hire nobody. And they say, oh yeah, we really like your site. We want to sign up for two years or whatever. So, you know, it's the yeah. same, isn't it? Sure. Yes. And yeah, yeah. The, the word matching is a great word, you know, mm. because whether you're doing a job interview or, you know, you're trying to make your professor happy when you're a student, all those matching, matching is the key there. Matching uh, requirements, matching expectations, mm. matching what they're looking for. Mm. You know, I mean, I've, I've been turned down for jobs that I, you know, didn't, I just didn't match with what they were looking for. And I get that, you know, mm. I could just leave and say, yeah, I'm not the right person for this job and be okay with that. Mm. But, and funny thing is when I got, got the, the university job that I left before starting this company, it was because I had a friend working there who said, look, they're going to ask you if you like teaching writing. And I said, I don't like teaching writing. He goes, yeah, I know, but you need to tell them you're excited about the opportunity to teach writing if you want to get hired. Mm, okay. And so again, hashtag networking, but also like their expectations were, we want someone who can come in and teach writing classes. Sure. I could also teach a uh, business English classes or presentation skills classes like I wanted to, mm -hmm. but I had to say, that I was interested in teaching writing classes. And I'm glad I did because I learned a lot and that helped me uh, with other opportunities in the future saying, oh yes, I've taught academic writing and I've taught uh, you know re scientific research writing and things like that, that really mm. helped out my career. But yeah, if I had been honest and walked into the interview and said, yeah, that's not really my thing. I would much prefer mm. to do X, Y, and Z. I wouldn't have gotten the job. Mm. I wouldn't have matched with what they were looking for. Mm. Very good tip there. So. Uh NB, uh, everybody that's listening has to, you know, match uh, what the client is looking for because, you know, just one wrong word or, you know, for one thing that they're exactly looking for, you're like, nah, you're, you're gone. And it, it, it might not matter, you know, how good you are. Uh, well, that's the thing with mm. interviews, right? Interviews are very competitive. So mm. they're almost looking for a reason to say no. Yes. As much as they're looking for a reason to say yes, because maybe they're interviewing five people and can only hire one or two. Mm. There's as soon as you give them a reason to say there's the door, mm. well, you know, you're done. So mm. how do you feel about this? Ah, oh, that's not really my thing. Okay, cool. Door next. Mm -hmm. And and how in, in Korea, this is um, something I'm interested in. Uh, it, uh, I lived in China, so I, I know quite a few people who had uh, ELT businesses in China. And they went with a, a needs analysis for the, the clients, for the, the customers. And uh, I don't know, in China, people don't really do needs analysis. They don't you know, complete certain things. They don't uh, like this sort of interviews, the, the needs. How, how is it in Korea? Are they pretty happy with a needs analysis it's not a problem uh i would i wouldn't say it's a foreign concept but i would say a lot of people would be like why are we why are we wasting time mm. on this mm. let's just let's just get to work quick 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 mm. get to it mm. so i think a lot of people would see that as you know look just just do what i want or just do it the way i want you to do it or just do what i you know and they wouldn't want to prepare, they would just sort of like things to flow and then they'll work them out as they happen. Mm, mm. Okay, In interesting for anybody working in Korea. Uh, is there, a, oh, what challenges are there for uh, someone from the US or, uh, in Korea? What, I, I, I don't know very much about Korean culture, but. Uh, what... Well, the visa is a big deal. Okay. Unlike Japan, mm. your employer for, for many people dictate your visa. Ah. So they have a lot of control. And then a lot of people would, would move over, say, to a, a marriage visa. Mm -hmm. and then it was easier before, but still now you can then transition to sort of a green cardy uh, permanent residence visa, mm. which is what I did. So that's why I was able to start my company because I'm on a permanent residency visa. If I was still on a teaching visa, I wouldn't have been able to do that legally. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay. They have a lot of control. Mm. Mm. And... You know, de dealing with clients, meetings, etc. What, what what sort of 
advice can you give for people working in Korea? Or if you're if you're work? coming over, be be prepared for meetings, regardless of whether they need to, hmm. uh, lasting either thirty minutes or an hour. Like they like, they like. And it's funny because you'll go in and you start talking to someone and then maybe after 30 minutes, they they look at you like, okay, well, you know, it's time to, to go, right? <laughs> or like things just stretch and stretch and stretch and you feel like you're wasting time until you get to an hour and they're like, okay, now now we can be done. Oh. So I, I noticed that a lot is the sort of like the expectation of, well, well, surely you're going to be free for the next 30 minutes. You planned for this, right? Mm -hmm. it's like, well, we could have done this in five, but I mean, okay, if we need to drink the coffee and make the small talk. Well, so be it. Mm, mm. So and then, of course, we could talk for an so, hour about taxes. I'd prefer not to, but certainly your tax obligations in both places are going to be something that someone uh, needs to learn about if you're going to start a, a business over here. Uh, okay. Especially. Yeah, as Americans, you have, you still have to pay tax, don't you, if you're you're living At abroad. least file, yeah. Uh. We're under $107,000 a year, which don't worry about that. I am. <laughs> um then you could you sort of file and you know you get your exemption mm. but if you start making over that well first of all good for you buddy but mm. then um, you do need to then st start paying taxes on top of that wow don't have to worry about that thankfully so let's let's go back to networking so we talked a little bit about uh social media so you go to a conference trade fair uh, what do you do? Are you do you work the floor? Are you kind of I won't say, use the word schmoozing, but you know how 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 can you network without appealing too needy or too schmoozy or you know just boring people with your pitch? What's Certainly, right when you balance? go to a conference, the, mm. the, one of the keys is going to be either you present and then you talk to people who ask questions or stay after about what you're doing because they're obviously interested. Mm. But then certainly going to choosing the right presentation to go to and then going and then being the person that that says hey i really liked what you had to say have you thought about collaborating on this or mm. you know are you interested in doing something with that or could you tell me a little bit more about that so the, the sort of targeted <laughs> targeted networking or you know hopefully you know a few people and then those few people can introduce you to a few more people is a good way to do that as well mm. Mm. so have a presentation I mean, if you don't have something to talk about, if you're just going to the, the conference to try to pounce on people, I think that's going to be kind of obvious to a lot of people. And having something to share, I think, makes it a little bit more reasonable to be there. That's just my opinion. Mm, knows. Um, so we talked about networking. Now, we different income streams. So you've got a lot of stuff going on. Tell me about that. Well, you know, certainly in the last year, um, the face-to-face -face training opportunities, whether it be going down and helping people at a huge conglomeration work on their presentation skills or going to a research center and helping them, uh, you know, get their papers published. Those things were not out there in 2020, at least for me. Hmm. So luckily I had a couple connections that they were able to help me get more editing clients. And so I did a lot of editing in, in 2020. Mm. And so that was really good is that, you know, it didn't totally dry up when the big money training opportunities did. And the inter face to face interviewing that that was few and far between There's still a few with masks. But mm. um, I, you know, you know how it is, you sit at home in your pajamas and do editing. And I did that quite a bit in, in last year, okay, in the beginning of this year. So because you have a, a diversified income stream, you can kind of move over in, into one area if, if another area is not. And, you know, if you go into editing, mm. even if you go into editing, there's so many different types of editing, you know, mm. there's certainly the, the proofreading and then there's more, you know, content copy editing. And there's a lot of different things. You can work with different translators who do translations and you do sort of back end, you know, editing and proofreading for them. Uh, companies, universities, I'm thinking about who some of my clients are, like, mm -hmm. there's a variety of individual people to government to the tertiary education, to research, there's a lot of people that that need, you know, whatever they're producing in written form to be to be checked and improved. And again, if 
you know someone who knows someone, generally you can get your foot in the door. But otherwise, if they have a, you know, an internal group of editors, which some places do, then you know, you don't want to waste your time with that because they already pay people to do that. But mm. the the sort of medium sized ones are often looking for someone freelance to come in and help them when they need help. Mm. Okay. So how do you feel about working you work from home? With these, yeah, ninety percent of the time, yes. Mm. So that brings its own challenges, doesn't it? I mean, as regards motivation to be able to discipline yourself and uh, schedule your day. Tell me a little bit about that. How you work from home? How? Yeah, that was certainly mm. a transition. I mean, I was lucky to have, I guess, a private office in the in the university job I had before this. So, I, you know, it was it wasn't like I, I missed a bullpen environment. But yeah, just being able to go next door or down the hall or upstairs to talk to some coworkers or meet them for lunch, uh, that that dried up, obviously. And so you have to find different ways to keep your your social circle. And, you know, it's funny. I'm I'm certainly happy to have the clients that I have, but I'll tell you, I have some big clients that I've never met face to face. Oh, and I'm sure that can freak people out to it's really funny. If, if I met them for the first time, it'd be like hanging out with an old friend. Cause we talk all the mm. time online, but I've like, I have clients in uh, Russia and different parts of Korea and I've just never met them. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I think that's familiar. Anybody who's worked in, you know, sales or uh, especially now with, with online uh, I'm sure I'll, probably never meet a lot of people i i know it's uh that's that's part and parcel of the the job so how do you f- define success what's success for you what's your work life balance and uh, what brings you satisfaction in, in your job you know sometimes i like to joke and say that i'm retired because you know you don't have the the 9 to 5 and you more or less choose how much work you want to do i i'm probably could do do a little bit more than I'm doing, but I could probably choose to do less as well. Mm. And there are busy times, but you know what? I mean, I think I could see myself being in my 60s and still kind of doing what I'm doing now. Mm. But I, I love having the option to be able to say no. Mm. And that's one of the key benefits to, to, to freelancing is being able to tell someone, yeah, no, I'm not available. You don't. You wouldn't say I'm not interested. You would say I'm not mm. available for that. Mm. And you know, the thing is, when you freelance, you can take on a big project, but if you take on a bigger one, sometimes you have to say no to some smaller ones in the meantime because you know of, of time management and or mm. you do have to be on site for something. Mm-hmm. So if I go up to Seoul for something that that's going to take three days, if something else pops up in the middle down here, I, I just can't do it. Mm. But success, I think, is choice, Mm. having the choice to be able to say yes or no. And basically, if you do have a relationship clash or a personality clash with one of your clients, you know, if it's with your boss at your full time job, you're Mm. sort of stuck. Whereas if it's with a client, you can pass them on, refer them or just say, look, this isn't working for me. So I hope you hope you need to find someone else. Mm. It's not firing them, but it's sort of uh, a breakup. Hmm. And why do you say no? What 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 are some of the reasons you say no? One is maybe you get, as you mentioned, you get a better, more lucrative contract, uh, maybe longer term contract. But are there other reasons why you say no? Ah, uh, I think that you know, if you don't feel like you're the right person for a job, for example, mm-hmm. um, and I've tried, I've tried some materials writing projects. Mm-hmm gotten my foot wet in that area and they just kept kicking it back and going yeah that's not what we we're looking for and i'm like well man i can't read your mind you know like yeah. you say these very loose guidelines and then i i get try to get creative and i send something to them and they're like yeah no not that i'm like could you be more specific they're like no nah, no nah. well okay that's not the kind of project that i'm looking for mm-hmm. i feel like i'm beating my head against the wall yeah and so I didn't enjoy that. And I probably wouldn't take on too many more of those hmm. uh, unless they were very specific or said, here are some examples, do it like this. Okay. That's cool. But when they say, Hey man, you know, just 
get in the creative groove and, and produce some things. And then you mm. do that. And they're like, yeah, no, that's not what we had in mind. That's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. And I think we've all been there. Haven't we? So, so you, you have the luxury of being able to say no. Yeah. I'm going to pass on this one. <laughs> mm. yeah, I've done that. And it felt great. And how important, so we talked about imposter syndrome, how an, another thing that entrepreneurs starting out, uh, they find difficulty with is saying no, because people want to take on all this stuff and say, you know, they get so many offers. Um, so can you give any tips to our listeners on saying no, how to say no? I mean, it's easy to you know, just say no, but you can some people find no. it difficult. You can say no when you're in a financially decent place. Hmm. So obviously having a financial cushion, you don't want to leave that salaried job that you're getting that regular paycheck unless you feel like you've got, you know, your little mountain of money you can have for emergencies, right? Hmm. So you've got to have that cushion, the financial cushion of, you know, some people say three months, some people say six months, hmm. and some people say more of what you need to have. That if things go very lean or, you know, you get hurt or there's some family emergency back home, that you can still survive for X number of, of months, right? So being able to say no, if you are in, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, which in this case is like month to month, mm. you really can't say no because mm. you're like, I got to eat, you know? Mm. So when something comes up that's too good to pass up, it's really hard to say no, but when you know if if you know that you've you've got a couple more papers that you're going to work on or you know something's coming up next month that's going to be really lucrative then it's easier to say no now plus mm. here's the thing this job like what i do there's a lot of seasonality to it um mm. this month in particular traditionally over the past 5 years has been a slower month because a lot of my clients are just getting into their new budgets and sort of just coming off some holidays and there's another holiday coming up next month things really will start to pick up again late february early march so knowing that mm. um, when something comes up now it's it's harder to say no because there's not much else you're doing whereas if it was in that march april period where things usually start to pick up it's easier to say no because you know there's going to be some other things that that people will need you for mm. so there's there's an excellent tip to our, our listeners we're we're um speaking to tim thompson from tim thompson elt.com and archer consulting in korea is have some savings um we i interviewed tyson batino from one coin english uh a number of days ago and he said exactly the same thing he had some savings in place he had that leeway the luxury and uh, the security as well to fall back on uh through budget is i have you always been a budgeter or is it moving to korea has uh instilled this discipline into you no i'd say i've always been fairly watchful mm. um, i remember when i was 18 I, I got my first sort of pre-approved credit card Oh, the mail, you know, and I'm a mm. college kid, I've got no job. And I'm like, Oh, my God, this is this is amazing. And I remember my dad saying, you know, never spend more than you can pay that month. Because mm. it's 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 their money, not your money. So like, use it very carefully. And I took that to heart and have been trying to be very careful, you know, and not ever put more on a credit card than I can pay off at that one time. And again, I wanted to have several months of, of stashed away money that was liquid in case you know in case nobody called that month and you know in the mm. first year or two you never know like now i feel better about things because i have some steady clients but that first first year especially i was you know mm. curious to see how it would happen how it would work out mm. funny funny story my dad actually confessed in the last couple of years that he gave me six months before oh. i went back and applied for another uh university job oh but he didn't tell you that at the time, of course. Not at the time, but yeah. he, he confessed it later. And he's like, you know, because because I'd never had to do that. So I have no idea what it entailed. And I'm, he was, of course, proud and impressed that I worked it out. But mm. it was kind of funny to have him admit that later. He's like, yeah, I, I gave you six months. <laughs> Does he come from a business? Is he a company employee or? Nope, educator. Oh, okay. Okay. So, 
I, I, sometimes if you come from an entrepreneurial family, it's, it's an advantage, isn't it? That, you know, you get that mentoring and the expectation is completely different and the attitude to risk, isn't it? Yeah, you can hear their war stories. No, I didn't, I didn't really have sort of a mentor for this. Mm. Okay, and um, um, why? Did, did you always have a, an entrepreneurial, kind of, we won't say gene, but an entrepreneurial itch? That you want to do your own thing, is it the freedom that is is very much a motivation for you? Yes, that was a big mm. thing. I did I did study business in undergrad, so I, I did do marketing and management as my undergrad majors, and then did my masters in TESOL later. But mm. um, no, I I've always been curious about the business side of things. Mm. But no, the reason I I left I don't want to say cushy, but I left the stable university environment was was just being able to have more control. Mm. So again, when you have a, a manager who shows you all the wrong things to do, you sort of go, you know what? I, I want to be in a position where I can leave when I'm not happy. And that's where freelancing appealed to me. Mm. Mm. And tell me about some mistakes you've made. <laughs> not in not in your work, but in 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 your business, and you know, oh, I shouldn't have done that, or you know, if if I were to advise somebody, this is what I I would say. Well, I'm not sure they're going to be something that would translate to to everyone else, but so mm. now, there were a couple times where I took not these aren't mistakes, but I I do remember, for example, doing some work for free, you know, like mm. with some volunteer organizations, and doing work with volunteer organizations can take up way too much of your time but mm. the the good thing about doing that is you can generally get some experience that you're you're not qualified for because they're just happy to have someone to do it but then with that experience you can transition that into working with another company so for example <clears throat> i worked with uh, the magazine for the english teaching organization here mm. so that when i tried to work with a larger you know print thing I said, oh, yeah, well, I've, you know, I've done editorial work with them. And they went, oh, okay, that's, that, that qualifies you. Uh -huh. But if you give too much mm. free work um, and take on responsibility, that can actually count against you later when you're trying to get paid work. Mm. Mm. Good point. And, and there are some people out there that will take advantage of free work. They'll want more and more free work. There's a lot yeah, of takers. they'll lay the guilt trip on you and say, yeah. look, no one, no one can do this like you can. Mm. Oh, wow. You know, we really need your experience and expertise here. Or you started this. We really need you to finish it. Mm. And yeah, when, when, you, when you have a regular source of income, it's easier to, to be like, yeah, you know what? Okay, fair enough. But <laughs> when you're, you're scraping by... That's that's not something that's going to help you out. No, no. Uh, so in the earlier podcast with Miranda Crowhurst, we talked a little bit about, uh, well, social responsibility, well, corporate social responsibility. But, you know, we could I I wouldn't uh, class you as corporate, Tim. But uh, <laughs> as regards social responsibility in your business, how do you, using the American phrase, pay, pay it back or pay it forward? What what's uh, what what do you do? I like mentoring. I'm happy mm. to, do, to do some mentoring, especially with, with, you know, younger people. Mm. Um, yeah. I've gone out and given some, some free talks because I don't want to say it's a favor, but I, I respect what, what someone's doing and they don't have a budget and, you know, go into a, a foreign language high school and give a talk just because, you know, you want to help those, those kids out, things like that. But yeah, obviously Again, there's so many hours in a day and you can't do too much of that. But yeah, or I had a, a friend at a university ask if I could, you know, come and, and talk to their students online. Mm. I mean, yeah, it's it's an hour out of my day. No, no big mm. deal. I can do that. So, yeah, I'm happy to to do something like that if I think it's going to have a positive outcome or benefit to someone. OK. And tell me about forming a company in Korea. What, what are the options? What are the, uh, what say, where, where, what's the... Scary easy, actually. Yeah. Scary oh, easy. really? Yeah. Um, basically, I went to the tax office and I told them I was doing something that was basically service oriented. Mm -hmm. 
and basically online for the most part mm -hmm. and said, you know, I want to be legit. And they said, okay, give us your address and a description of what you're doing and the name of it. And they gave me a, a little certificate and I had a, a business. Oh, really? With oh. a tax obligation. Yeah. So mm -hmm. <laughs> they were happy to do that. They're like, oh, you're going to pay taxes. Great. But yeah, I mean, now I have a company. Now, if I wanted to have a brick and mortar language school or something, that would have been a bit more difficult. Mm. That would have involved leases and different mm. kind of, of company registration. And, you know, when you hire people, that's a whole nother thing. Mm. Luckily, I work by myself, so I don't have to worry about that. I keep it small, I keep it stream streamlined, so I don't have to worry about that. But, you know, sponsoring another foreign person's visa would have been a, a big hassle or mm. trying to explain to them where my brick and mortar, you know, and then I have a lease or I bought it or I'm renting like that's, that gets really, really tricky. So online streamlined is just going down to the tax office and getting a piece of paper. So that way, when I'm working with a larger company and they want to pay me, you know, with VAT, for example, then I've got the tax number and we, and I've learned how to do the forms online for that. So that really helped out. Okay. So, so not so difficult as regards the ease of doing business, where is Korea, you know, starting a business and, and running it is, is it like in, in the top 10 or is it you're going to mid table some, some language, mm. you know, proficiency slash help mm. because you know, not all there's still a lot of tax stuff that there's no English really website for, or, when you call the English hotline, they're like, yeah, well, we can't help you with the website. We don't know how to do that. So that's mm -hmm. interesting. But again, when you're doing English related stuff, a lot of the people you're going to be dealing with are probably going to be Koreans who speak a decent amount mm -hmm. of level of English. So that makes things a lot easier. There's going to be some, some contact at almost every company you go to that's going to be their <laughs> foreigner wrangler, you know, so mm -hmm. you can, they, they'll be the one to meet you at the door like, hey, how's it going? And then like, will help you with some tricky stuff working with some of the other people in the company. Mm. That's a good point. If you work in the ELT world, you're generally going to work with people who can use English. So maybe it's not such language is not such a barrier as maybe other industries. No, if you worked mm. in, you know, construction or something like that, you're going to need a quite fluent level of Korean to get by. Whereas I honestly don't. Mm. Okay. And how, your research and let's say books that you read on entrepreneurship and, and running, running a company, running a business, uh, what kind of study do you do? Well, you know, I, I've certainly enjoyed reading different books about starting companies, but, you know, no one really knows what you're trying to do specifically. And no one's going to write a book that specific that's going to match with what you're trying to do, especially when you're doing it in a foreign country. So you can get general ideas and tips, you know, especially for working with clients or telling people about what you do. But no, you, you really need, well, I, that's why I wanted to come on this podcast and talk to your listeners is to try to give specific examples for people trying to get into a specific situation. So I think the niche of you working with EFL magazine puts us in the ELT genre. And then, you know, me working in Korea, I can give specific examples about that. So when you put it together, there's probably, hopefully, a couple of people out there that are looking to do something pretty similar. And this will be more helpful than reading a book of you know, how to start your own company in 30 days or something like that. Yeah, I, I hope so. There is a kind of a common thread uh, among the, the podcasts I've done. And one was, of course, having having a budget and uh, having having some savings, that seems to be, but not always. I, I've had a couple of guests and they were, uh, Ian Simpson, uh, he, he won't mind me saying because it is on the podcast. He was uh, 15K uh, UK in debt when he started his business. So, you know, I, I, wow. I suppose that just supports what you're saying is, uh, you know, it's business. You can't really, nobody knows everything about it and uh, it's it's unique. And uh, especially in this situation, the the COVID, COVID situation, who knows all, everything's out the window. So uh, as regards COVID and education and your business for the future, uh, over the next year, you're still working away. And uh, how, how do you think the business landscape will look for you post COVID? Well, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm positive, because mm. I think that when we're able to do more face to face things, you know, I'm going to get 
phone ringing off the hook is what I, I'm hoping is going to happen. So if I can keep the editing clients happy and add more face-to-face -face work, I think I'm going to be sitting pretty, you know, but when, when we're there, I, mm. I don't know. It's hard to say because we, we haven't seen a single vaccine over here yet in Korea. Oh, really? Not yet. Oh, um, I think the government sort of took a, let's see how other people do it. Or let's see if we can develop our own local one first. And I don't think either one of those really lends itself towards going ahead and pre-ordering and getting them on the shore. They're not here yet. Mm. What words of advice can you give to somebody who wants to start a, a freelancing business or, or business in, in general? They want to make that leap. And, you know, maybe they have a few fears around being an entrepreneur, the uncertainty. Yeah, they should. Mm. <laughs> they should do it. No, no. Well, they should they should have fears and concerns, oh. and worries too, because you you know you never know what it's going to be like. You don't know what it's going to be like until you get into it. Mm. Someone could you know be stringing you along. Going, oh yeah, no, no. We'll, we'll definitely work together. You know the, that guy down at the pub is like, oh yeah, we should work together sometime. And you're like, okay, well, I got I got him. And then you know you mm. you quit your job and you're like, so you're ready? He's like, yeah, maybe in six months. And you oh goodness, I wasn't expecting that. Mm. But. Hey, again, no regrets for me, but maybe that's because it worked out. But if if you don't have the right professional network, and I tell this to my to my university students back in the day, when they say, "Oh, professor, can I get a recommendation letter?" It's like, okay, if if no one's going to speak up for you, if no one's going to put their stamp, their endorsement on you, then you're going to have a hard time. Mm. But if people, you know, I've got friends, I've never seen them in the classroom so it's really hard to say what they're like as an educator mm. good good friends down at the pub but i don't really know what they're like so again you can have people that say that they will endorse you but if, until they really have worked with you or know what you do that could be hard a hard thing to ask mm. so certainly you know you have to ask yourself how much do i want to audition do i want to do a free paper or a discounted paper before i do a full fee paper do I want to go give someone a free presentation or short, you know, lecture to show them what I can do so that when a, a paid opportunity comes up, they think of me. Mm -hmm. But here's, here's what I would suggest is to try to do those free things in that time period as you're planning to leave your full-time paid salary job, mm -hmm. right? Where you don't really need the money. So try to get some of those auditions in early so that when you do need the income, you've already got people that know what you can do. Mm. Mm. Ideally, but you know, in the in this COVID situation, a lot of people are being pushed out of positions, aren't they? And uh, they don't maybe have the savings, and they don't have the clients, and uh, it, it's very much backs to the wall, isn't it? I mean, that's that's yeah. a tough one. Again, mm. when you when you choose to do this. And you're mm. able to comfortably plan for this. It's certainly going to go a lot smoother than if you're thrust into it or forced into it, or you know you feel like, well, gosh, there's no other option right now. I don't have a job, so I guess mm. I'll try to freelance for a while. Mm. And that's that's not really a commitment. You don't you haven't committed to it. You haven't prepared for it. Um, you haven't put put pieces in place to be successful. So that's that's going to be a lot more challenging, and I I feel for those people that that are in that situation. Like I said, mm. I I started thinking about this two plus years before I made the move, mm. and that you know, talked to people, started planning, prepping, making notes, writing down ideas. That mm. that really helped out a lot. Mm. And just a comment on the the flip side of your situation. So where you are at the moment, you can say no, you can pick and choose clients and you can say, okay, I want to work on this and it, it's fine. But on the other hand, if you're, if you're looking to catch up in, in a job, I, I speak from experience in sales and going through some tough times with the financial crisis. Yeah. Uh, the worst thing is desperation. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So people don't smell that, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's a kryptonite. Yeah, it's really the worst, uh, the worst situation. And it's like the Matthew principle, isn't it? What 
for for those that have more should be given and for those that have nothing you know everything should be taken away um so if if you're desperate if you're if you're working to catch up if you're catching jobs here and there it's it's really a bad situation to be in but once you have the mindset and you know you're contented the clients can feel that can't they well as soon as you're pre-offering discounts for example Mm. you know what i mean yes like they're they're pretty much fine but you're like oh you know and 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 i'll i'll take 20 percent off and they're like whoa wait what well geez Mm. okay but wow that's for it's almost saying going back to imposter syndrome that Mm. they don't believe in the value of their service and or product Mm. right and and that's that would scare a professional a high level client off i think in a lot of cases where they're like geez yeah again you said desperate the word desperate Mm. and so when you're pre-offering in oh no no i'll give you a discount like they didn't even ask for a discount Mm. why would you offer a discount if they didn't ask for it Mm. yeah and it's it's what would we say it can be a vicious cycle or it can be self-fulfilling prophecy what what happens is that when when you're going well you have more confidence in your business you get good feedback so naturally things will happen you know you can afford to say mm, maybe i'll come back to me and the clients will come back but if the success is not there it's you know it's it's like it's like when the the rungs of the ladder fall fall away on the in the movie you just slide slide huh. down and it's uh, it's it's a bad situation to be in on the you know on the flip mm. side of that going back to saying no when you say no or not now to a client what that signals is i'm very successful i don't need your mm. your job but you know what try me again later and maybe i'll be able to slide you in and they're like whoa gosh i hope i get mm. the chance to work with that person so mm. conversely being able to say no can be actually a positive in that long-term relationship because mm. now you become the the white whale, right? Like, oh, mm. I hope I can really work with that person. They're really busy and hard to, to, to get to work with. Mm. Exactly, exactly. So if, if for, for a situation like that, for somebody who's, you know, in business, maybe in, in this situation, I, I've been there, you know, I think all salespeople have been there. And I, I worked for, for a company during the financial crash in, in Ireland, I worked for, and I, I was selling recruitment advertising at the, before the crash, there was a, what, 3% unemployment during the crash after the crash was 15%. Wow. So, and I was selling recruitment advertising. So you can imagine how desperate I was. Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, for somebody who maybe is in this situation, what, what advice can you give them? How can you, you, how can we steer this ship around? Well, let's just, let's just go back to, to price versus value mm. versus quality. Your, your first reaction there is going to be, I need to be the cheapest option out there Mm. but certainly in something like education in something that is you know quality based like proofreading or editing where you know expectations are pretty high Mm -hmm. i don't think being the cheapest option out there is necessarily something that's going to help you if you're looking actually to make this into a long-term career sort of thing Mm. it's only going to hurt you Mm. so yeah you've got to sort of balance eating today with undercutting yourself and just making the market so, so bad for yourself um, that, yeah, you're, mm. you're scraping by and you're going to continue scraping by because it's hard to then say, oh yeah, by the way, I need to charge a lot more than mm. what we were doing before, mm. but I do it at the same level I was doing before. Mm. So that's a hard thing for a client to swallow. It's like, wait, what? You, you did it for that before why why would you want to be like double or you know half again now mm. Mm. and uh, as as we've related a few stories today i can relate one not, not my personal story but uh, a client gave me advice on in this situation and he said he was a uh, I, I won't go into too much detail but he was an importer and he was uh, selling his product he was the first to introduced this particular product to Ireland maybe about oh, 30, 40 years ago. And he went to one of the largest uh, retailers and 
he wasn't getting much change and they were giving him a hard time and uh, they're a big client. And uh, he just said, you know, I don't need your business. And that's always stuck with me to, you know, to have the courage to, to, to do that. But he said, you know, at the end of the day, you don't need the business. You know, you can always walk away. Well, that's where having a, you know, sort of stable of clients is very important. Have a variety of clients where one is not so important that if you lost them, because then you might as well just have a boss, right? Mm, Sure. One client is that important. They're going to have that. The power dynamic is not going to be in your favor. And they're going to realize that pretty quick and go, look, you know, if you don't do what we want, we're going to pull our business. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. Mm. So having a variety of clients where if they threaten you and you're like, well, it was really nice working with you. I hope maybe we could do this again in the future. And they go, wow, mm, okay. Mm. Didn't have the power they thought they had. Mm. And sometimes you you will find not just with clients, but with people as well. The, the way I like to put it is they like to recruit for soap operas. Huh. You, know, so, you know, you know what I mean is, is that they, they want to get you involved in some kind of drama in their lives. Uh, oh, yeah. we, we don't need that. No, for sure. Like, yeah, I... I actually had a friend pass on a client to me because it was getting too, too drama laden. And I said, I'll I'll take them on. But, you know, I said, here are my ground rules. Mm. And luckily that client followed all that. And we never had a problem, but I think it's because at the beginning, I I knew what had gone wrong with the previous work relationship. Mm. And I said, look, if you, you know, if you contact me to, to chat about something when I'm busy, you know, I'm gonna have to charge you for that. He's like, Oh, well, I won't do it then. No problem. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So um, I'd, one more time, uh, we'll talk about Tim's site. So Tim, uh, I've lost actually my piece of paper that Tim I had Thompson written on. ELT.com. There you go. Thank you. Um, I should have a better filing system here. So Tim, are you? how can you be contacted? You're, are you on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and all the usual? Sure, all the yeah. regular places. But you know, I, I, you could even go to the website and send me a message from there. But yeah, mm. just go check out the blog. Um, not as active as I used to be, but I think there's some good content on there if you're interested. It's all for free, obviously. Uh, link to the my book is on there about uh, how to teach presentation skills. Okay. You know, that's something that I put together during one of the slow winter periods because I thought this is something that a lot of teachers get blindsided by their administration where they're like, oh, can you just teach a presentation skills class next semester? And they're like, well, I've never done that before. And the books for that, while they can be okay, they don't, they give exercises and activities, but they don't teach the basics of of how to teach presentation skills. And that's why I put the book together. So anyone who's interested in learning how to teach, how to teach presentation skills, the books for them. Now, it's not a big money maker because it's a very small audience. If you want to make money off books, you have to write them for the students, Mm. not for the teachers. Mm. So, well, live and learn. But it was, it was a good project and I'm glad I did that. And what, where it, that's available through your site, it's through Amazon, yeah, Barnes & Noble, it's all the usual an places. I do have yeah. some print copies, but it's basically an ebook, So it's, you know, very cheap and easy and you quick, quick read too. How much is it? Like five bucks. Five bucks. Well, there you go. Uh, so if you want to cup teach of coffee. presentations, yeah, a cup of coffee in, in Starbucks. Isn't For it? sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know how, ex- I, I think it's expensive everywhere, isn't it? Um, so thanks very much again, Tim, um, for coming on this show today. Um, Tim Thompson, ELT.com and Archer Consulting. And Tim will be in the uh, EFL Magazine Business Podcast group, uh, the Facebook group that we have. So uh, we'll be posting the podcast. Well, you know that already you're listening to it. (laughs) So (laughs) you will be posting on the site and we'll have it on uh, through the usual channels. And um, I'm sure when we post the the piece that Tim would be available for a few words, if you want to clarify things or sure, send in a question, want to, uh, if you want to, um, if you have some business for Tim, I'm sure he'll, uh, He'd be more than happy to um, try not to say no and consider it. Yeah. Try not to say no. Try not to say (laughs) no. So, Tim, thanks again. My pleasure. Thanks, Philip. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast with Philip Pound. For more great advice and resources, check out EFLmagazine.com. If you found this podcast helpful, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. See you next time.